You are the ugliest, most disgusting thing I've ever seen. I thought people like you died at birth. Kind of tells a story about marginalized people, people living kind of in the corners who one day decided to stop living in the corners and came out to live in the middle. My friend is not a retard. Actually, he's probably smarter than the three of us put together. He's certainly smarter than you. He's got cerebral palsy. See, it affects his motor skills. It means that his brain is perfectly functioning while his body's more or less useless. This is a man who unquestionably changed the world for millions of people. OK, you know what? You guys can leave, or I can call the police. Call him. One man can change the world, so it was really about how this one man helped um, start a movement. And back on action. And action. The differences that you make that are the ones of lasting importance, they're the little differences that you make in the life of another person. I met Richard about eight years ago. He was uh, giving a speech at a conference that I was attending, and the speech that he gave is his life story. He has this amazing ability to take the audience on this roller coaster of emotions where one moment people are laughing hysterically and the next moment they're crying. And as I'm listening to this story, I'm picturing this film in my head, and I go up to him after the speech and I said, you know what, we need to make this into a film. And he's like, first off, who are you? You know, second, why do you want to do that? And I said, well, it's the same reason you talk about it. It's a great story. I'm a speaker. And when I, when I give speeches to companies and groups, you know, I, I, I tell parts of my life story. I just tell stories. And uh, Steve Salowitz was, was in the audience of one of my talks. And he heard me. And he came up to me afterwards and said, this should be a movie. And I, I just looked at him. <laughs> I said, well, uh, OK, and then I started looking to see the, who the next person was who wanted to talk to me. And he, uh, he said, no, I'm serious. I make movies. This should be a movie. We kind of discussed it a little bit and then left ways. And about two years later, I came across him again. I'm like, hey, we should really do this. And just kind of yeah. kept at him for another year, to, like just wanting to write, start writing a script and just like, let me show it to you and see. And if you don't want to do it, then that's great. And we sat down with him for about two days and really flushed out a storyline. And you know, most films are based on a book. Well, I, I kind of got Richard to start writing a book as we started writing the script. Uh, this is my letter of acceptance to the university. And I also brought a couple of recommendations. I can't authorize government funds to send you to college. Why? You're deaf. I'm what? It's a, it's a deaf joke. <laughs> Richard Pimentel who I had the opportunity to play, it was a guy, he came back from uh, the Vietnam War and he'd lost his hearing in the war. Well, they told him that his, his life was pretty much over, that he wasn't gonna be able to go to college, they, they weren't gonna give him his VA bill because it was gonna be a waste of the taxpayers' money, and sort of said, sorry, but thanks for playing. And the movie kind of starts from there and, and, and how he decided, made a decision that wasn't gonna be enough for him. I met Ron in uh, Minneapolis. We spent uh, a couple days together. He heard me give a speech so he could kind of feel what that was like. And then we sat down and he, we just talked. Ron initiated most of the, the questions and uh, my role in there was to simply be as honest with him as I could. I, you know, I had all these ideas about how he's gonna play this deaf guy and I took a look at Children of Lesser God now, you know, and it's like, okay. And then I met Richard, uh, went and saw him speak and it's the damnedest thing you there's no way you just wouldn't know that he's that he's deaf you you couldn't tell he reads lips uh impeccably you know his speech is better than mine there's no way to tell so it i, I kind of had this interesting problem of of how am i going to play the story of this deaf guy when there's no way that you can tell that he's deaf and to me, that was kind of the key of the movie because it, that, that's when it made me realize, you know what, I'm not playing, I'm not playing a deaf guy. I'm playing, I'm playing a guy. I'm playing Richard Pimentel. Uh, damn Boy Scout, you, you think uh, you're too good to talk to me? Wait a minute, I understood that. Uh, you want a, a fucking medal? No, I want to hug you. I got the script sent to me, 
As soon as you get a script, normally I kind of look at the first few pages, I try and find the introduction of the character that I'm up for so I can get an idea of it. And this script I just started reading and went straight through from beginning to end. It was such a compelling story and such great characters and such an amazing, uh, you know, true life story and, and uh, really informative and, and compassionate and engaging. So I just read the whole thing and thought, I just, and, and the character as well, it was such an amazing character. So I just, by the time I finished the script, I thought I really, really want to do this film. Michael's, Michael's an amazing actor and, you know, we, we were auditioning many actors that had cerebral palsy for the role, as well as actors who didn't, and we were, my main thing was to find who Art was as a person and not just who could portray his disability the best. And that's what Michael really did, is he really nailed down who Art was, and his uh, cerebral palsy was just one of his characteristics. I had no one for me to go. Hey, watch it! Oh, sorry. Can't you go forward in that thing? Uh, sure, if you blow me. I thought the biggest challenge of playing this character would be to play someone who has a very extreme physical thing going on, like cerebral palsy. And I thought that would be the main thing about it. And then when I actually got to meet Arthur, Art Honeyman, who I play in the film, um, and spend time with him, then I started to get much more specific about the character. And that was when I realized that actually the biggest challenge to play this character was not about the cerebral palsy, but it was about the qualities that he has as a man. And he's such a sort of amazing, you know, he's so clever and, and sharp and irreverent, passionate and funny and charismatic and charming and all these things. To be able to get those qualities to come through when you're very limited in what you can use to express yourself because of the, the cerebral palsy and how it affects your body. I realized that that was actually the biggest challenge. You need a menu? Actually, my manager told me that we can't serve. You can't serve pancakes? <laughs> I think you two need to leave. You're making the other customers very uncomfortable. Art Honeyman got $10 for his birthday, and, and he calls me, and he said, pancakes. And it's 2 in the morning. It's like 1972. Someone calls you, says pancakes. Seems like a good idea. Normally, we wouldn't have had much of a problem, but there was a waitress there who had never seen art or anyone like art, I imagine. And she refused to serve us. And that had not happened to us before. And art just said, I won't go. And I thought, that's right, we won't go. She called the police. And we thought the police were going to come hear the story and arrest the waitress. But they came and told us that we had to go to jail if we didn't go. And art said, he said, I want to go to jail. And then he said, and Richard wants to go to jail too. And I'm thinking, I don't think so. But as I thought about it more, we said yes. We found out that we had broken this incredible law. It's called an ugly law. Back in the P.T. Barnum days, uh, everyone loved to go to the freak shows, but no one wanted the freaks to come to town. I found out that the smartest man I knew and my best friend it was against the law for him to be on the streets of his own city. And I'm a disabled Vietnam vet. And I'm thinking, you know, I didn't go over there and come back to find that I was living in a disability apartheid. And this incident basically made me an activist. And all we wanted to do was change that one little law, just that one little law. And then we found out it was in 23 different cities. We found out it wasn't as easy as we thought it was going to be. And we had to change all the laws in the entire country so art could have pancakes. So we did. Thank you. Well, that's the slowest service I've ever seen. Only took us 20 years to get these. Uh, uh, be cool. Uh, you could uh, get, get us arrested again. I would have to say that the one thing that this movie is about, how we see people um, and whether we see people. You know, we all have a tendency when you first see people, you make a snap decision, you make a judgment. It's natural, you know? We're, you're supposed to do that. You're, you're, your brain's hardwired for that. The question is whether you then stop looking at the person or if you continue looking at them and continue to make further judgments from there. 
if there's any kind of message, I suppose, of the film is that anyone, if these people dealing with the things that they've had to deal with just in their own lives day to day with the disabilities that they live with, if these people can still make the difference that they make, then what excuse has the rest of us got?